will be in the area uh, today canvassing uh, the residences and uh, commercial units for uh, video and witnesses. And Michelle, yes, Toronto police are asking for the public's help as they try to piece together exactly why a man was killed outside a low-rise apartment complex here in North Etobicoke, the latest in a series of shootings in our city in the West End. Police cordoned off the scene of the crime just past 11.30 last night. There was maybe four or five shots, really loud, um, and then like a car sped away. And Cop cars blocked that end off, blocked off up there, it's all taped off. All the cruisers around, they wouldn't let anybody through. By light of day, you can see evidence markers scattered outside a low-rise apartment building at Bergamot Avenue near Rexdale. Outside the front entrance sits a red vehicle. I can tell you that the vehicle is involved. Uh, other than that, I can't, I can't go any further about the vehicle at this stage. While police won't say if this was a drive-by shooting when the vehicle was removed, it was covered in fingerprint powder, its door sealed by evidence tape, and you could see some damage in the driver's side door. I don't feel good. Something happened, something happened, it was no good. We are scared. Uh, I've lived here for 45 years, and it was such a safe uh, neighborhood. It's kind of sad, but uh, unfortunately, we have to uh, deal with these problems every day, day in and day out. Toronto paramedic services say they assessed one male patient near the building's entrance, but they did not transport anyone to hospital. Police confirm a man was pronounced dead at the scene. My team and I have been out since last night and uh, we're going to work diligently and around the clock till we find those uh, responsible for this incident. Today, area pastors condemned this latest homicide, saying in just two weeks, six people have been shot in the city's West End, five of them killed. People are afraid. People are living in fear. We should not be living in fear. We call on the government to address this problem in these high crime neighborhoods, in, these, in Etobicoke, we call on them to do something. Now we say, you know what, enough is enough. Police say they have no immediate suspect information, but told CTV News the victim was a man in his 20s. We all have our kids, right? It's scary, very, very scary. I feel sorry for parents. Now, investigators say they understand that area residents are frightened, and they say they will have an increased police presence in the area for the next few days. In addition, they're asking anyone who may have any dash cam or surveillance video to contact them as soon as they can. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Nathan. Well, Nathan, it was an emotional day in the courtroom as families of Susan Tice and Aaron Gilmore delivered victim impact statements, some of them speaking directly to Sutherland, a moment they have waited more than four decades for. A day the families of Aaron Gilmore and Susan Tice have been waiting four decades for, facing Joseph George Sutherland in court, who last fall pleaded guilty to murdering both women in 1983. Speaking directly to Sutherland as he sat in the prisoner's box, Susan Tice's oldest son, Ben, said, in his victim impact statement, truly the most haunting is the question of why. Why would you take this life of my mother and Ms. Gilmore? What right did you have? Tice was a 45-year-old mother of four when she was brutally murdered in her home in August 1983. You murdered, assaulted two wonderful women, and went to live your life. Your free life is done, Ben Tice said to Sutherland. 
22-year-old Erin Gilmore was murdered in her Yorkville apartment four months later, just days before Christmas. Also speaking directly to Sutherland, Gilmore's brother Sean McCowan told the court, You altered the course of so many lives because of your senseless acts of rape and murder. You murdered her and not only ended her life, but also her dreams and future. She was an amazing person. You ripped a hole in all of our lives that could never be fixed or filled in. He also spoke about the unbearable pain and suffering both families have endured. I would have loved to have had him come forward. I think our whole family, my mom, would have loved to have known who he was and, uh, and had him face justice while she was alive. Sutherland was unknown to police until investigators made a break decades later following technology advancements in genetic genealogy. That led them to Sutherland in Moosonee. He confessed to a retired OPP officer and was arrested in 2022. Sutherland pleaded guilty this past October to two counts of second-degree murder. The court has heard Sutherland sexually assaulted and stabbed both women multiple times. The trauma of losing Erin has left huge gaps in my recall of childhood memories. She was an angel, Erin Gilmore's brother, Kalen McCowan, told the court. He was 11 years old when his sister was murdered. He got to live his life. He pursued things that were important to him. He got to raise children. He had a career. I had a sister, and she didn't do any of those things, he said. Sutherland, who is now 62 years old, faces an automatic life sentence with parole ineligibility for at least 10 years. The Crown is requesting he have no chance of parole for 20 to 22 years. The defense is asking for parole eligibility at 18 years. Now, at the end of today's hearing, Sutherland had an opportunity to address the court where he expressed remorse and said, quote, I'm still trying to understand where I went wrong. Sutherland will be sentenced on March 22nd. Reporting live from Mike Walker, Michelle, back to you. Hi, Nathan, that's right. A couple hundred protesters, in fact, are still here in and around Union Station at this hour. We'll give you a live look at the scene here in front of Union out on Front Street. They began up on Richmond and marched down to the York Concourse inside the building, uh, spending a couple hours chanting inside, trying to appeal to the rush hour crowd of commuters, asking them to listen to their message and join in their call for a permanent ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war. The group here calling this emergency action, criticizing the federal government's handling of the Israel-Hamas war, calling on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the federal government to do more to prevent a humanitarian crisis in the Middle East. Here is more from a few of the protesters inside just a few minutes ago. We're here at Union Station in the middle of rush hour to make sure that anyone that's passing by also hears us and to welcome them to join us to make our voices loud and clear. To make sure, as I said previously, no business should run as usual when our government is complicit in the, in the genocide of the Palestinians. We don't want this to continue. Uh, this is beyond atrocious. I think the longer this goes on and the worse it gets, 
there's no denying the, the horror and the oppression and what's going on. But here today, it's a proof that it's not. It's proof that we can, like people united, like that we can live, we can live together. But as long as there is no injustice happening, as, there, as long as there's no occupation, there's no genocide, no killing, no starvation of people, regardless of who they are. And so this protest does continue at this hour. There is a significant police presence here, but from what we have seen, this demonstration has been peaceful thus far. It is continuing. We will keep an eye on it. Some disruption uh, to the commute, but just mostly due to the volume of people. We will bring you the latest on this demonstration tonight at 1130. Reporting live from Union Station, I'm Natalie Johnson. Michelle and Nathan, over to you. This man shouted those words while brandishing a nail gun at a group of pro-Palestinian protesters and apparently shooting it twice. Don't do that, guys! Disturbing for those witnessing it, most of them setting up for a nearby protest of a meeting to sell real estate in and around Israel, held at the Aish HaTorah a short distance away. We do not believe in violence. And also disturbing for Rabbi Avram Rothman, who spoke to CTV News from the synagogue Monday. Is, there is no justification for a person to bring a nail gun to a protest, regardless of what side he is. Rothman said he allowed that real estate meeting to happen after their other location fell through. When you have a large mob, you never know what's going to happen. So people were apprehensive. Some of my members are Holocaust survivors. Tensions high as the war in Gaza continues, started with an attack by Hamas that killed more than 1,000 Israelis with hundreds taken hostage. More than 30,000 people in Gaza have been killed. York Regional Police charged 27-year-old Ilan Rubin Abramov with weapons charges, assault and mischief. Social media posts suggest he works as a plumber in Vaughan. His Facebook page was not outwardly political. Court records show a withdrawn dangerous driving charge. His listed address was right next to the plaza. Vaughan's mayor, Stephen Del Duca, thanked police for a quick arrest and said in a statement, I do understand that other protests may be planned for later this week. I'm calling on all organizers and attendees to avoid behavior designed to intimidate, disrupt, or incite hatred or intolerance. B'nai B'rith said the episode should encourage law enforcement to keep protests farther from places of worship. No one should have to curtail their right to protest. Although I do believe that, the, that our authority should be imposing limits upon where it is, where we're individuals are able to protest in the name of public safety. Pro-Palestinian protesters said they were targeting the land sales, not the synagogue. John Woodward, CTV News. From the prisoner's box in the Oshawa courtroom, James Musali seemed in good spirits smiling to his parents before the decision. After it came down that the 36-year-old would not be released on bail, he appeared to mouth the words, I love you to them. Looking back, his mother placed her hand across her chest. Leaving court, the couple had no comment. Their son is a former nuclear operator with Ontario Power Generation, which operates the nuclear plants in Pickering and Darlington. He's now charged with communicating safeguarded information to a foreign entity or terrorist group that could harm Canadian interests under the Security of Information Act. And this person was denied bail. That should also tell the public something about the serious nature of this charge. Criminal defense attorney Ari Goldkind says this type of charge in Canada is rare. 
While RCMP have said there is no known risk to the public, they allege Musali acted with intent to put critical infrastructure at risk. This is very serious business punishable up to life in jail. We don't know much about it because of a publication ban, but this is certainly a very serious allegation and power, energy and electricity probably runs and goes to the heart of every single thing that happens in this city, province and country on a daily basis. According to court documents, Musali lives in Clarington with the allegation stemming between January 30th and February 1st of this year. He was arrested February 9th. Today, OPG says as the case relates to an ongoing investigation, it can't comment, but in an earlier statement said it uses sophisticated security technology and intelligence to keep facilities and communities safe. These systems worked. Immediately upon identifying an information breach, OPG and RCMP implemented measures to mitigate and manage any further authorized disclosure. Public safety and station integrity have not been compromised. One condition with Musali's continued detention is he cannot communicate with any OPG employees except union representation to discuss his employment. The case is back in court March 25th. Beth McDonnell, CTV News. We saw new Democrats focus on a couple issues that have been priorities for the government. That's cost of living and everything around driving, but the, the government didn't go for it. Yes, that's a plane landing on Highway 407 in Markham back in 2021. An embarrassing sign, the NDP feels, of how few drivers are steering down the tolled highway. The highway is underused because the tolls are too high. New Democrats pushed the government in a vote today to bump up usage among one set of drivers. The NDP, truck drivers, transportation experts, environmental advocates have all called on the government to remove Highway 407 tolls for trucks. The government shot down the proposal. Every step of the way we've been there for truck drivers, whether that's about supporting and building the 413, whether it's about removing tolls on the 412, 418, whether it's about reducing or fighting the carbon tax. The NDP reasons giving truckers free access to the 407 would relieve pressure on other highways, including the 401. So that people who are also sitting there commuting, sitting in their cars, uh, stuck in traffic can get home faster to their homes. Most of the 407 is owned by a private firm, but the opposition feels the government has leverage. The transportation minister didn't entertain it, talking about their commitment to Ontarians on new highways. They want us to build Highway 413, and they sent a strong message to this, that member and the previous Liberal government about their inaction to build infrastructure. The Liberals and Greens voted with the NDP, but Green Party leader Mike Schreiner thinks covering tolls would wipe out the need for new highways. We can subsidize up to 21,000 trucks a day on the 407 for less than over a 30 year period, then less and then half the cost of building the 413. The government disagrees. They've pledged to block tolls on highways they control, but not on the stretch of the 407 east of Ajax it's in charge of. Well, they're banning future tolls, but they own a big piece of road and they're still charging tolls. Like, put your money where your mouth is. The NDP says their proposal would have saved truckers as much as 80 minutes driving and up to $60 a day. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. All the federal parties are looking to see, does this confirm what we think about where the trends are going? And you always have to be hesitant not to read too much into by-elections because they can be unique. People sometimes use them to send a message. You can get strange results based on very low turnout. But the parties are looking for confirmation. 
the conservatives want to know, yep, we're riding high in the polls, we can win seats, we can certainly re-elect ourselves into seats that we held already here in Ontario. The Liberals are wondering, you know, is there any chance? Can we get off the mat? We've been behind now for seven, eight months. Is there any chance that we score a surprise victory here? There's a new report coming out looking at the financial health of Canada's amateur sports system. The report was commissioned by the Canadian Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committee in late 2023. And the financial consulting firm Deloitte says that over the next five years, Canada's 61 national sport organizations face a collective deficit of $134 million. They say that there's a solution for this and that it's more federal government money. The Canadian Olympic Committee and Paralympic Committees are asking the federal government for $104 million worth of new annual funding. The problem, they say, is that federal funding for amateur sports in Canada has not increased since 2005. And that's at the same time as expenses are skyrocketing. Think of the costs of airfare, hotels, food, training, hiring new coaching staff. And again, the federal government has just not kept up, according to the Canadian Olympic and Paralympic Committees. Rick Westhead, CTV News, Toronto. I think at a high level, it's by making sure that people aren't reinventing the wheel, that what is what has worked, what is proven, what is going to be effective um, uh, can be implemented uh, everywhere around the country uh, instantaneously. I think knowledge translation is going to be so critical. One of the pieces we're working on and we've talked forever is data. We think about that in patient records or in uh, sharing data between institutions. Thank you very much. From his home in Mar-a-Lago, Donald yeah, Trump took a victory lap thanking the judges. It's unanimous decision today. It was a very important decision. We're very well crafted. And I think it will go a long way toward bringing our country together, which our country needs. 
In a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court said Trump was wrongly removed after Colorado's Supreme Court kicked him off the ballot. Officials there argued his actions during the January 6th Capitol attack we fight like hell. to overturn the election made him ineligible to ever run again. Traitor! Using a Civil War constitutional provision that bans anyone who is engaged in insurrection from holding federal office. The justices wrote, only Congress has the authority to enforce that. Allowing states to do so, they said, would create a chaotic patchwork. Their ruling puts Trump back on the ballot, but doesn't clear the former president. He still faces criminal charges for his conduct. But for Colorado, there's disappointment. States should be able under our constitution to bar oath-breaking insurrectionists. Ultimately, it will be up to the American voters to save our democracy in November. All this just a day before Super Tuesday, when Colorado and a dozen other states hold primary contests. Trump is the Republican frontrunner for president, already pivoting to his next fight. Presidents have to be given total immunity. They have to be allowed to do their job. Donald Trump isn't done with the Supreme Court. The justices have agreed to hear his defense, his argument that presidents should be immune from criminal prosecution. Trump faces 91 felony charges. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. I don't know how I fell into this trap, but they certainly caught me. Lenora Bellamy of Ajax says she was on Facebook when she saw what she thought was a news story about an investment opportunity. She contacted the company and started with $250 in cryptocurrency. When it appeared to go up, she handed over more money. I'm not usually that big of a pushover, but somehow they managed to push all my buttons, made me trust them, and I put more money into it. Bellamir ended up being scammed out of $80,000. That's a few years' income for me. 
The Better Business Bureau says investors may believe their money is growing in value, but when they go to take it out, they can't. When individuals are trying to um, take that money back out, they're unable to. Um, sometimes uh, the app just disappears. Criminals are also using AI to create fake ads with high-profile investors like Elon Musk. Millions of users were able to close all their debts in the first week on the platform, buy a car a month later, and buy their dream home six months later. Plus, if you don't make your first million in six months, I will personally give you a Tesla Model 3. The fake videos are popping up on social media and being sent through hacked accounts. This great investment, you need to act now, click on this link, um, and then you find out later that it really wasn't even your friend, their, their account had been hacked. To protect yourself against AI fraud, remember AI can make fake images, audio and videos, impersonate well-known companies or individuals, generate fake investment opportunities and use voicing cloning for deceptive marketing. Bellamere is still hopeful she can recover some of her funds and regrets falling for the scam. Stay away from it. It's too dangerous. Just everybody be really, really super careful. The money is just too hard to come by these days. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. season by regular standards and he lifts this one to deep center and there is absolutely no doubt about it man oh man did he get up the middle that is a base hit
there was a time at the oh, at the end of the season and I felt really good about where I was at and I wanted to try to give it one more go. Uh, but, you know, being home with the family, getting married, um, you know, today is a sad but also happy day for me. It's sad because I'll be, you know, not able to go out there and, and, and play the game that I love anymore, but it's also, you know, very happy uh, time that, you know, I get to be around the family and, you know, kind of take that next uh, chapter in, in life. So we start round four with Domi. And the Leafs have their first shootout lead. Jeff Latto got shingles at age 58. I guess my situation might be a bit unique because I experienced the abdominal pains um, about 24 hours before there was any visible rash. Like many, he says the episode was excruciating. It's surprising how um, acute the, the pain is, and it, it doesn't really abate. Uh, adults are developing shingles uh, more often. Dr. Christine Palme says there are several reasons why we're seeing this. First, our aging population. Most people in Canada have had a chicken pox episode, whether they uh, know it or not. Um, you know, certainly as our youth age and become older, the question is, is what's going to happen with shingles? A vaccine against shingles was first introduced in Canada in 2008, and more recently an improved vaccine has been offered, the two-dose Shingrix vaccine. But it's only provided free to Ontario residents 65 to 70 years old, despite a recent NACI recommendation to offer it to Canadians over age 50. Uh, I talk about the long-term risk of developing a condition called post-herpatic neuralgia, which is a chronic pain condition that debilitates patients. The risk of developing a stroke or a heart attack is elevated after having a shingles episode. Lato says he was just considering whether to get the vaccine when he came down with shingles. He did get his shot about a year later. The two doses add up to about $300. Not cheap, but if you don't want to wait until age 65. And it's very important to have that conversation with your um, family doctor about, um, you know, should I take the vaccine or should I not? Veterans, First Nations people, those covered under employee health plans, or people with immune conditions may also be able to get the vaccine earlier. Pauline Chan, CTV News. five shots really loud um, and then like a car sped away today's action is all about one thing 
telling the Canadian government to renew its commitments to UNRWA. We know that a significant number of trucks would benefit from the move to the 407. We've been hearing that from trucking companies themselves. The federal government revealed the date for the 2024 budget. Finance Minister Christia Freeland will present the budget on April 16th and says the economic plan will focus on cost of living, building more homes faster, and creating jobs. And the federal deficit for the current fiscal year stood at $23.6 billion at the end of December. Last week, Freeland said that the deficit would not exceed $40 billion. Let's take a look at the closing market numbers. The Canadian dollar down modestly at 73 cents U.S. It was a down day for oil prices as well, shedding about a dollar per barrel, while Canadian oil prices advanced by two dollars per barrel. And the TSX finishing lower, closing down by about 20 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Amber Canmar in the BNN Bloomberg Newsroom. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. Tonight, a cross-country tale of two weather extremes. It's going to be cold. This is unbelievable that we're out this early. Digging out in the prairies while other parts of Canada swing into unseasonal warmth. Later on CTV National News. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. It's a day where youth girls basketball is being celebrated. At the MLSE launch pad on Jarvis, the TCDSB regional championships got a bit of a boost. As Toronto Raptors Kelly Olinia, Grady Dick, Jalen McDaniels, Emmanuel Quickly, and Garrett Temple paid a visit. I didn't know they would come here or like to support girls basketball. That's just it's a dream come true, honestly. I was I was so crazy. I'm so excited. Like, I've never met a big sports team before. I'm shaking so much because I'm so nervous and I'm so excited that they're here. Being able to meet NBA players was meant to show these girls what it means to be in sport. It means a lot for me because sometimes I feel like um, boys can make like sexist remarks and they just like people pass it off as nothing. But I love seeing like women empowerment in sports, especially because I love playing sports and all sports. And I think we should encourage this more. So as the kids get to see their heroes up close, they don't just get an autograph, but a great memory in sport. Seeing their faces uh, light up is, is great to see. And, uh, you know, we need to shine more light on women in sports, which is, is great to see this. Raptors Garrett Temple says he was inspired by the women in his life and that it's important young girls learn the lessons sport can provide. Uh, it teaches you how to lose gracefully, you know, how to win gracefully, and, um, you know, some of the things that you can use once you finish, once you grow up into adulthood. Statistics show that young girls are much more likely to leave sport early in their teens. And why it's so important for them to stay in cages, we know all of these 
benefits of continued sport participation, and you don't get those if you stop playing. So we just need to continue to value girls and young women in sport differently and create opportunities like this for them. Opportunities and memories that can last a lifetime. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News.